Hello and thank you for joining me again today. Today I'd like to speak to you about salvation and soul winning. Because the two are completely inseparable. In order to have salvation, somebody must have been soul winning to you in order for you to get saved. So as we go through the process of salvation, some sow, some water, and some reap. I want to give you a complete explanation about how that actually works. Everybody needs to be a soul winner. That is the way that the Christian faith grows. And unless you're a Calvinist who believes you're elected, then soul winning is a must for you. You see, God does not elect people. He has given free will since the Garden of Eden all the way through to the end of Revelation. It is free will to come to God. So therefore, somebody has to be a soul winner in order for you to obtain salvation. Romans 10, 13 and 14 says this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? There's your role, is to go and tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the most important things to remember when you're soul winning is that it's God through the Holy Spirit that gives the power. It's not you. You actually do not ever win a person to the Lord. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts the person that they are a sinner and they need to get saved. Okay, We don't do the saving. God does the saving. And it's also the same when it comes to seeing the fruit. And this is a misconception that is always, uh, I guess, difficult for people. And as human beings, we want to see evidence of, of people getting saved. We want to see the fruit. Look, God sees the fruit because, as I said before, some will sow, some will water, and some will reap. You may not see the reaping, but other people, especially God, will see that reaping. Everybody that gets saved is not necessarily going to walk through the door of the church that you are in. Okay, That's a very, very, very small part of the place where you live. It, it, I know I live in Australia. It's a huge country. And when we go out soul winning, we meet people not just from all over Australia, but from all over the world. So when you soul win, don't necessarily look for the fruit. Remember, your job is to sow, your job is to water, and if God so chooses, then you may see the reaping. Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I personally believe that everybody can be a soul winner. The problem is, I guess, that people um, believe you need to be some kind of biblical scholar or you need to be some sort of extrovert in order to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just want to assure you that I'm, I'm neither of those, okay? I'm a person who just loves the Lord and believes that others should be told about the Lord. Within your church, your leaders are the people who should be teaching you these principles and how simple it is to talk to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. There are very, very simple ways to start. The the easiest way to start is just by putting tracks in, in people's mailboxes. And you do that for a while. Sooner or later, when you put a tract in somebody's box, someone will come and ask you a question. Now, at that point of time, you may not feel equipped in, uh, to answer that question. Very simply say to the person, look, you know, there are people in my church who'd love to speak to you and, and answer the questions. Um, I'm just here to put tracks in the box. Very simple way to do it. Until you actually learn the verses and you learn how to, to communicate with people, just simply go out and do tracting within your local community. Leaders in the church, it's very, very important that they teach the people how to do this. Because it doesn't matter if it's the person next door or the person who lives across the other side of the world. Every person needs to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. The approach might be different 
for different people. And you can learn that. That's not that difficult. Some people are very hard-hearted. And most kind of people, you have to be very gentle, very slow, and explain things to them because they can be very gruff and very, mm, I don't want to hear about this. They're different principles. Some people are very gentle-hearted and you can sit them down and they'll even start crying about the sin. So there are different ways to approach different people, but it's paramount that you learn those ways because the Christian life is not complete without soul winning. The Bible says in Proverbs 11 verse 30, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. One of the greatest experiences you'll ever have in your life is seeing somebody turn from their sin and coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, starting a new life. And a zest that they'll have at that time to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. I know I did. I told all my friends. I told all my family. And, you know, some people might think you're crazy, but you go around and you tell everybody, don't lose that zest. I got that zest over 25 years ago, and I still haven't lost it. I still tell my family, I still tell my friends, I still tell my work colleagues that there's a hope, there's a faith. In our world today that's changing every day and every minute, there's something else going on. But Christ hasn't changed. The same yesterday, today, and forever. I keep telling people the same message, that God can save you. We've got to try and maintain that zest. Because remember, unless somebody soul, wind and witness to you, you may not be saved either. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I'd like to share with you now some statistics about soul winning that might... Uh, Shock you somewhat, but this is what we're told about statistics. The fastest growing religion in the world today is Islam. There's a very simple reason for that, and that's because Christians have stopped soul winning. Many, many, many Christians. I believe that less than 10% of Christians are active soul winners. Let's look at some local statistics for our country here in Australia. According to the um, Bureau of Statistics, the fastest growing religion in Australia is no religion, atheism. Again, that's the fault of Christians who are not telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, 90% of the other faiths are conscious and active when it comes to telling people about their faith. But for some reason... Christians have stopped doing it. I don't quite understand why we're doing that. And then we look and we say, oh, why is this happening? Let's have a look. The JWs claim to knock and evangelize in their local area every year, every house. That's amazing. And they're growing. The Mormons... They claim that they're growing. It's part of their membership to be a soul winner. The Seventh-day Adventists, they go out and hold numerous outreach events to reach 70% of the population. That's not what Christians are doing. The reason that our churches don't grow, the reason that we're not seeing revival, the reason we're not seeing people saved is because not enough people are going out. And that's because they don't have the confidence. It's not being taught. Most people would not know how to lead somebody to Christ. Now, if that is you today, I want to ask you this. I want to plead with you. Go to the leaders in your church and ask them to show you how to soul win to your friends, your neighbours, how to soul into people outside of the church, whether it be in the street, in the bus, no matter the park, doesn't matter where it is. Ask them how to do it. They should know how to teach you to do it. There are opportunities every single day of your life to witness to people, even over the telephone. 
Over social media, there are so many opportunities to witness to people. But if you don't know how to do it, then you always feel a bit awkward in doing it. But I promise you this, if you allow God to empower you, you'll always find a way to do it. And if you don't have all the answers, don't worry. Say, look, I'll get back to you. I'll go and find the answers. Go and speak to a leader and ask them, how do I do this? They should know. Ask them. Because it is the most victorious thing you can ever do in your life is to reach out to somebody and lead them to Christ. These statistics show us we're not doing it. We need to do more. I'd like now to look at some of the excuses that people use not to soul win. And some of them break my heart. And the first one is that I guess really gets me is when people say, look, it doesn't work. <sighs> well, well, what are you looking for? Are you looking for people to walk through the door of the church? Is that the, the barometer that we use to see if people are saved or not? What if they don't live in your area? What if they've already got another church they go to? Look, the barometer is not who walks through the door. The barometer is how many people you've reached. Because they could go off somewhere else and reach more people for Christ. My wife and I were saved by an American missionary on George Street. And today... That very missionary, he doesn't know what I do. I'm not even sure where he is now. But he sowed, watered and reaped. He'll know when he gets to heaven, the fruit of that. He doesn't need to know it now. Because sometimes, you know what happens if we see lots of people get saved, we get puffed up in our own imagination that we've done something. Look, it's wonderful to see people come through the door and be on the pews and, and know that you've had a hand in that salvation. But it's more and more wonderful to know that there are hundreds around the world who might have been affected by what you've told them. That's really, really important. And remember, when people walk through the door of the church, it's generally not the members that are talking to those people about salvation. We might greet them, we might say hello, we might ask them their name, we might ask them where they're from. But it's generally the leaders, the pastor or the deacons or somebody, who will challenge them on salvation, challenge them on their faith. That's left up to them. If it was every member, then that would be chaos because the person would run out the door straight away. So we do that in an orderly fashion through the leaders. So you're not even getting an opportunity by the people to walk through the door. Where do your opportunities come from? If you do not make your opportunities, they're not going to come. And Lord is not sending people to you. We're not Calvinists. That's not how it works. Oh, the elect are coming over here. The elect are coming over here. No. No, no. We must go out and seek and save the lost. Otherwise, what are we doing? You know, relative soul winning is very important. That's the people around you, your friends and your family and your neighbours. But I have to say, if that's all you do, if you don't do anything else, then you could be feeling a little bit discouraged. Because that part of my soul winning life is the smallest part of my soul winning life. I've only ever seen a few people come to Christ that I know personally. Remember the words of Jesus Christ? He said that a prophet's not accepted in his own town. Take that as truth, because when people know you, it's even harder and harder to witness to them. Spread your wings. There's a whole world out there waiting to hear about the gospel. And some of you might travel a long way to work, or some of you might meet lots of people at work. You can speak to them about the gospel. You can invite them to church. You can tell them about your testimony. There's so many ways you can do it. You have to hit them over the head. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you can have a victorious Christian life if you allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life and speak to people. Don't be scared. 
don't be scared. I want to encourage you. I want to motivate you to go out and reach the gospel for those who are suffering and those who are lost. We can do it. You can do it because God will empower you to do it. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I recently um, needed to buy a present for a fellow Christian friend, so I went to a local bookshop, which I very rarely go to, um, simply because uh, I find it very confusing. Um, and that's simply because every uh, shelf was packed with a different Bible with a different version, the ESV, the NIV, the AFT, the DBS. Every, there were hundreds and hundreds of them, all saying slightly different things. But, you know, irregardless of that, and all those different versions and all those different ways of saying different verses, which I, I'm not a fan of, I call them perversions, because they take what was actually written and, and, and change it a little. And with all those Bibles out there, could you imagine, if you're not a saved person, the confusion that comes in your mind? Because some of those Bibles have got bits missing, some have got things changed, some have changed the verse so it's completely unintelligible. You can't understand it. I love my Bible, my KJV Bible. It's simple. I can understand it. It's very, very simple and very straightforward. This is another reason that we need to soul win because the devil's put so much confusion in the world. Just walk in that bookshop and you'd just be blown away. You know, you go to the children's section and you see the Noah's Ark with animals and people hanging over the side. What a nonsense. That's not true. That makes the Christian faith out to be like a fairy tale. Okay? It's just not true. I mean, you know, what well, would be nice for the kids? No, no, tell the kids the truth. They'll thank you for it later in life. It's important. There is so much misinformation out there. And we have the truth. We have the gospel. We have the healing through the Holy Spirit. We know He dwells within us if we're born again believers. We need to tell other people about that. You've got a cure for their hopelessness and their misery. Share it. You'll never regret it. I've, I'd like to share with you some things that have been said to me over the years when I witnessed the people. And uh, there's many reasons why they say, oh, I'm not listening to you about your faith. And, you know, I'll, I'll share some of those with you. One person said to me, oh, I've been sick for 20 years, so I'm not going to trust God. Another one says, well, you know, if God wants me, he can accept me as I am. Another one says, I don't want to be judged. You know, another one says, you know, I'm a good person. Um, heard it all before, you know, people say, oh, I want to party with the devil, you know, lie of the devil again, you know, all those things. Let me tell you that confusion is the devil's greatest weapon, weapons of mass distraction and confusion. You see, people get so mixed up in themselves that they forget that there's a greater power that is God. They want to deny it, they want to reject it, they want to use some excuse not to have to listen to you. Tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, over the years what I have noticed is though, generally there's two kinds of people that want to talk with you. And that first one is those who want to mock you and waste your time. And the second group of people that want to stop is people who are searching. Try and differentiate between those who just want to waste your time and those who are actually got a, a genuine heart and wanting to search. Because what I've discovered over the years of soul winning, if you spend all your time with a person um, that is really just there to mock you and make fun of you and has no desire to listen to you, then you really are just wasting your time. Move on to another person, but don't feel discouraged. Again, I say to you, you may, you may have just planted a seed 
in that person. You may have just watered in that person. Even though they mocked you, even though they made fun of you, even though they might have said ridiculous things, you do not know, and I do not know, what effect we have had on that person when we've told them something. Because you can't see it, but God can. And if the Holy Spirit is working through you, God's Word never returns void. That's His promise. So if you come back from Solomon and say, well, nobody listened, it was a waste of time, then you didn't go out with the Holy Spirit, did you? Because if you went out with the Holy Spirit, I promise you, it was no waste of time. Absolutely none. You need to go out, not with you, but with the Holy Spirit. And every soul-winning trip that you go on will bear something. You may not see it, but God does. Isaiah 55.10 says, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not hither, but watereth the earth, and make it bring forth, and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. And verse 11 says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper into the thing whereto I sent it. I want to read that again because this is a soul winning verse that you need to keep in mind and have a listen to what God says about when you go out and you give people the word of God. It says this in Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. That's you. The Lord is sending out with his word through the Holy Spirit. It will not return void. Another story I'd like to share with you today is one about an elderly lady. And uh, this happened to me some years ago. I was uh, sitting at work in a company car. I drove down to my favourite coffee shop down at the station to grab a coffee. And this morning was bitterly cold, bitterly cold morning in Sydney. And um, it was raining and drizzle, one of them days. And uh, I was sitting in the car... And I was just waiting for that drizzle to stop a bit so I could go across the road and grab my coffee. And coming down the alleyway from the station, I saw an old lady. And she had a, a, one of the shopping carts with her. She was pushing it along. And they're sort of paved stones. So when you push a, a cart along, it's sort of boom, 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 boom. And this lady would have been in her 80s. And um, she was bent over and she was pushing the shopping trolley through the drizzle, through the rain, this freezing cold morning. And I thought, goodness, you know, poor lady. Um, I must have gone out to do her shopping or it was something of that nature. And she continued to walk past me and in the car. And I thought, well, if she's got one of them a plastic um, things over her head, like a covering that you don't see much these days. But... Um, uh, it just stops the rain from, from going in your hair. Anyway, and she proceeded to walk up the street, which is a bit of a hill. And she stopped when she got to the first house and reached into her little trolley and put a, some kind of leaflet in the box. And, um, you know, there are many people who put leaflets in blocks, boxes these days. Most of them are uh, advertising material for you know, supermarkets or um, department stores or something like that. Anyway, so she went to the next place, it was a block of flats, and she put one in each one and <clears throat> got her little trolley and, and, and moved on. And as she did that, a couple of the tracks that she put into that flat uh, unit block there um, had fallen onto the floor. And she just kept walking. <clears throat> so I, I got out the car, I was curious, because anybody who's ever delivered leaflets before for, for those sorts of things would know that you're making a couple of dollars an hour if you're lucky. This lady, like I said, was in her 80s. It was drizzling with rain. It was freezing cold. And there she was putting these leaflets in boxes. I thought, wow, 
you know, this is, uh, uh, I guess, amazing for somebody that age to be doing that just for a few dollars. So anyway, I, I thought, well, I'll go up and I'll put those back in the box. So I walked up to where the, the, the leaflets were and I picked them up. I want to tell you, they were not advertising leaflets. They were gospel tracts. This woman, in her 80s, barely able to walk, in the drizzle and the rain, the freezing cold, putting gospel tracts in letterboxes. I felt about that big. And I've been doing soul work for a long, long time. But such faith, such compassion, such trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that she do that. Lord bless her work. Got me thinking, I need to do more for Christ. There's so much more we can do, isn't there? We just have to put our mind and our heart to it. Matthew 10.32 says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. I'd like to read you today from the Bible the story of Saul and Stephen because I believe that is a, a great place for us to look uh, for motivation as a soul winner. In Acts chapter 6 and 7, in Acts chapter 7, 57, it says this, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The story there of, of Saul and Stephen is that Stephen was about to be stoned. He was dragged out of the city. They were not listening to him anymore about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was dragged out the city to be stoned. And we read that that stoning was overseen by a man called Saul. Now Saul, later on in the Bible, does get saved. But I want to say to you this. There was a process for Saul getting saved. And part of that process, I believe, was the witness of Stephen. Because Stephen said, lay not this charge to them. Now, Stephen never saw Saul get saved. Probably a million miles from everybody who was around there at that time, when the stones were being thrown, would have thought, listen to that man. Listen to him. Listen to what he says. See, the Lord's not saving him now, is he? Throw another stone. But what Stephen said, I believe, had a profound effect on Saul later down the track. All those little things, that witnessing, that forgiveness, that testimony of Stephen, all helped. And that day when Christ said to him, Here I am. You see, those people there that day probably thought that there was no hope for anybody standing around throwing those stones. Least of all the leader, Saul. <laughs> Saul went on to become one of the greatest witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ in that era. Never ever, ever underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit when you just obey God and witness for Christ. What Stephen did had a wonderful effect for all eternity. 
it was certainly not a waste of time. Acts 1.8 says, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. A great soul winning verse. I'd like to share with you a story today about soul winning, and I've got many, many, many over the years that I'd like to share, but this one is about a young man who, who really touched my heart. And uh, this young man was in the prime of his youth. He was a very, very fit young man, very good athlete. And uh, he was part of our church. He was part of our, our children's ministry, teaching the children. He had a burden for children. He wasn't even married, but he had a great burden for children. He would have made a, a wonderful father. But this young man, um, unfortunately, he contracted a cancer. And uh, being a very strong young man that he was, the first round of that cancer, he was able, through the grace of God, to defeat that cancer and go on and, and do some other things. But unfortunately, the, the cancer came back. And uh, it did, didn't stop this young man being in church. It didn't stop this young man being a soul winner. It didn't stop this young man worshipping the Lord. As a matter of fact, he grew even closer to the Lord. And as the days went on, he became weaker and weaker and, and weaker. And he was hospitalised and... I guess like most people, I thought that the end was near. But then one day, I was out on the street and I was soul winning and I looked across the road and I couldn't believe it. I thought, there's that young man. And there was Johnny Manor handing out tracts. I had to cross the road busy road. I pressed that button a hundred times. I ran across the road and there was a young man handing out the tracks. I was lost for words. I'm not normally lost for words, I can assure you. But um, I was lost for words on this occasion. I didn't know what to say. And I said, wow, it's great to see you out here. And he said, yes, there's much to be done and not much time to do it. There's people out here who need to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to get saved. And he continued handing out tracks. A couple of weeks after that, he went home to be with the Lord. I've never forgotten that, and I never will. That young man has a place in my heart forever. Because he was obedient to the last breath. And I pray that I can be obedient as soul winning to the last breath as well. Because that is the victorious Christian life. That is seeing other people who are lost and dying come to Christ. Who is it today that you know that needs to come to Christ? Is it a relative? Is it a friend? Maybe it's even your own parents. Oh, tell them about the Lord Jesus. Don't wait. No one's guaranteed a tomorrow. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. Tell them the Lord Jesus Christ still saves, always has done, and always will do. Don't they deserve that? You can do that. You can do that for them. They're worth it. I believe that everybody can be a soul winner. That's a victorious Christian life. Very important verse in Luke 15, 10, it says, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. When a born-again believer does not want to be a soul winner, I believe you're suppressing the work of the Holy Spirit. 
you're living a defeated Christian life. There's so, so, so much that you are capable of doing. Never let anybody tell you that you can't do it. You can do it. It just takes a little bit of understanding, a little bit of patience. And anybody can become a soul winner if you allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. Don't neglect such a great gift that God has given to you. It's a privilege not even given to angels in our day to witness to other men. You can do it. You are capable of doing it. And the Lord wants you to be a soul winner. You can do it. By the grace of God, you can do it. And one day, when you reach heaven and home, you will hear these words. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. God has a greater purpose for your life. God has a greater purpose for my life. That purpose is to help the lost and dying. To bring them to Christ. Thank you. God bless.